Peter, welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so great to have you here. Thanks for having me. And a very good hello from Richard here. Thanks and, and lovely to, to, to see you after all this time. Yes, it's good to see you both too. Now, Peter, can you uh, give us a little bit of background about uh, where you've come from? We've had a bit of a chat before we started recording, so we want to rewind that and uh, let our listeners know a little bit about uh, where you've come from. Yes, well, in a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away <laughs> prior to uh, my background, I'm basically um, obviously a clinical hypnotherapist. But before that, uh, my first point of um, origin within my career path was as a psychopharmacologist. Um, so I was originally involved with working with the drug, with drugs and the brain, doing research into ways of helping to manage anxiety, depression and phobias, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, very interesting um, career. Um, we were very good at bashing the drug companies. Uh, they were saying, here are wonderful drugs. And we were saying, yes, they're wonderful, but. So they kind of didn't like us very much. Um, but it was something that needed to be said. And within that, I was, you know, we were looking as, at um, dental phobias. We were looking at the use of the benzodiazepines. Um, that was our big area um, to manage anxiety, to manage um, not depression, uh, the anxiety element of depression, but also to manage the uh, um, phobic responses and so on. And I really enjoyed what I did, loved what I did. Um, and unfortunately or fortunately, I was good at what I did, which then yeah. basically meant I got promoted. Hurrah, wonderful. But as anyone knows, when you get promoted, you get promoted away from the thing you enjoy doing right. and put into things that you perhaps don't like. So I ended up being in all of these budget meetings and health <laughs> and safety meetings, which you know, health and safety, very important. Um, but it wasn't ticking my box. And then I was working at Guy's and St. Thomas's um, uh, in London in those days, and they were merging with King's College, so it's Guy's and St. Thomas's hospitals, merging with King's College. And then the opportunity to take voluntary redundancy was coming up, and that was a point for me to think, well, I really want to reassess what I do. And I... I'd always been told I was I was good at listening and I was good at um, being able to uh, offer advice. And so people say you should go become a counsellor. And I think, yeah, right. Well, I'm kind of looking to doing that. And um, I was looking for cool, uh, courses and I came across hypnotherapy in the first course I came across was the one that I ended up training with. Um, but being me, I then went out and thought, right. I need to research everything here. Um, and I kept going out there and there's some good courses out there. There's some pretty awful courses out there. Um, and in the end, I ended up going back to the college that trained me, um, trained with them um, and, you know, having a nice lump sum through voluntary redundancy being given to me. Um, I was able to then spend some time um, back in the mid nineties setting up in practice as a clinical hypnotherapist. I also, because of my science background, I was very, very interested in the research and the science that was going on um, around hypnotherapy. You know, it's wonderful. It does amazing things. But I want to understand what's going on in the brain. Is it a placebo effect? Is it something real? Which, of course, we now know through tons of research that's out there that shows it's, it's actually something tangible that happens within the nervous system. Um, but uh, I, I then got interested as well in, in thinking, right, I want to teach this. And I went back to the college that trained me um, and ended up um, lecturing for them after a while. Um, within that, we were doing a little bits of research, looking into uh, one that's ongoing even now, um, use of hypnosis with asthma clients, um, people who were look, um, managing their pain, again, with the uh, team I work with now, we are we have active research in the use of hypnotherapy or hypnosis in the management of pain in surgery. So people undergoing 
surgery. Yeah, so, so I'll just jump jump in, in there, Pete, because that's and, and you know what sort of tickled Matt and I, uh, our our sort of uh, direction towards you, our fancy towards you, was this scientific background, this medical background, mm. this this framework, because we know that what that does is that sets up an approach that sets up the system, uh, and uh, and that that your um, that you would have approached. Uh, 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 hypnotherapy from this very point of view of okay, so what's it doing? Where's it going? Mm. And and then of course you're confirming that now with your 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 very conversation. And this idea, there are a number of areas uh, that, that we want to look at. So let's just jump onto that one. I've got little boxes on a on my piece of paper, my notes here, and you have a part separated, not separated off, but distinct, uh, made distinct uh, in the course of medical hypnotherapy. So this idea of working with pain, you talk about pain, there's IBS, mm -hmm. which we know has an enormous mental component as well as the, the, the biological component. Uh, so let's have a look. And one of the questions I'd like to ask you is, is uh, what you do in, in relation to anesthesia, because I know that's a big thing, uh, for example, in dental work, but also we're looking at that in hospital work as well. So with that prompt, can you take us down that little pathway for a, for a second with the school? Yeah. If you, if you think about it, humans have the most amazing ability to dissociate. Um, we can split our minds. We can split off from emotions, but we can also split off from feeling. Um, time and time and time again, you have those situations, say, in a war zone where somebody has been badly shot and they don't notice that they've got this gaping hole in their back because their mind is so focused on surviving their mind is focused on fighting and then one of their um uh, fellow soldiers comes up and says my gosh look at the back look at your back and they look at the back and then ah the pain comes in um so with pain management in hypnosis what we're looking at is several things one the ability to dissociate and to split away from your perception of of pain and it does work you know you mentioned dental hypnosis um i've made uh, the decision that you know i teach hip uh, no, i teach hypnosis i teach pain management um i you know been in there when they've been cutting people open and they've just under hypnosis and i thought i've got to find out for myself and so i had some dental work that needed to be done and bravely i decided to ask my dentist um actually do you mind if i just use some hypnosis to take away the sensation and it was amazing. Um, I was just imagining remembering what it was like. So I was using memory to associate into what it was like to have your gum completely numb. And when I began to think and feel, perceive that, I indicated to my dentist, carry on, didn't feel a thing. Um, I'm not saying something that everyone can can do you've got to have a belief but you've also we also have to look at the concept you're going in for surgery are you a good enough responder with hypnosis most people will be but are uh, is your mindset ready for this so do you believe uh, or do you have a good rapport with your therapist which calms you down is your mindset positive are you starting to think of other things can you dissociate away in which case fantastic um, we can do something or if you're full of anxiety then you're probably not going to have any any reaction there with standard pain management we're looking at cognitive processes as well um, so we know that, you know, with hypnosis, if you um, induce analgesia, uh, you're doing very some uh, things within the brain through scanning studies, the anterior cingulate cortex, which amongst other things deals with our perception of suffering is turned off or you can, we can affect the somatosensory cortex, which deals with the quality and the sensations um, that we're experiencing. So instead of um, feeling pain, we can change it to, for example, pressure or a tingling sensation or something that is a lot more acceptable to the person. This, um, this, was, the, this was the interesting thing. Uh, Ericsson, Milton Erickson, who mm. uh, I'm, I'm fortunate uh, not to uh, unfortunate not to have met, but I, I was lucky to mentor under uh, with Ernest Rossi, who was so I was sort of I was one step away from him uh, in many of the stories. But 
he, of course, worked on, again, as you did with, in the dentist chair yourself, uh, he did work with people, but he was polio, he had post-polio. And uh, I can remember the story he would say to Ernie where he would have this terrible pain in his shoulder and he would go through a whole series of processes to change the nature of the way he perceived the pain uh, and what he did was he couldn't get rid of it. He found he couldn't totally eradicate it, but he changed the shape of it. And uh, uh, there were various things because I, I always amused because Ernest Rossi was was chided by Ericsson because he said he said I've made it long and down my arm and and Ernie Ernie said um, oh but isn't that worse and he said no why do you think I spent an hour doing this <laughs> so <laughs> you know, I don't, it's not as much easier to cope with but this idea. And, you know, we look at this in so many different areas and I look at what you teach in the school and these things that change the nature of association and utilise the aspects of dissociation are all the way through the school. I see here EMDR being taught. Mm. I see aspects then of, of CBT, NLP certainly is going through. And I just want to draw you now across to that side of things because I'm fascinated by the term the London School of Clinical Communications and Hypnosis, and the areas where you're dealing with the uh, the psychological, more the, the psychotherapeutic, is what you call the clinical communications area. So can we go into that area before we go into the sort of EMDR and addictions and things, which I want to talk mm. about as well? Yeah, I mean, with clinical communication, what, what we have is essentially a uh, an eclectic approach to therapy, which certainly in the UK, um, we're seeing a lot of people doing. So we're recognizing that people need to be trained properly, of course, um, you can't just pick up a book, read it and then hello, I'm therapist come and see me yes um, just on brain surgery and i'm in yes yeah. <laughs> yes i've always said to people would you go and have your appendix removed by, by a surgeon who only learnt how to remove an appendix from reading a book you wouldn't um so we what we find is we have various people wanting to come and learn various skills we have the hypnotherapy side of it which was our, our origin so to speak um but we've also discovered that the clinical communications aspect where people are wanting to do and learn therapeutic skills that aren't necessarily and I might dispute this you know hypnosis based you mentioned the MDR which it really well Shapiro's side of the world uh, Francis Shapiro who developed it would say no it's not hypnosis um I actually believe there is an element because you go into an altered state. Yeah, I'm, so I'm I would actually, argue it is. Yeah, I'm with you there, there. There's aspects. But what I think is good about it in the sense of the school is EMDR also has a, a, a lot of um, psychotherapeutic uh, exploration and an examination mm. before you do the eye movement, which is oh, a very much uh, very much engaged, well, certainly in focused attention. It's a type of focused attention, which is really yeah. the fundamentals, which is, you know, Michael Yapko describes hypnosis as that as well. Precisely. Um, Precisely. And, and this is very helpful, I imagine, for, for people. And, you, and does this bring in people who are actually um, sort of uh, sitting with feet on both sides sides uh, of the thing of the hypnosis and of the therapeutic type of approach absolutely and you know with 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 the the way hypnosis is developing now people are bringing more and more um, well they're merging the two skills together or several skills together um, things like cbt um, we teach cbt but we also teach cbh which is cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy um, again because the research is out there when you bring hypnosis and you bring cbt together you get a better outcome certainly it seems with things like depression um, so people we got people who come to us from several different perspectives. One is I want to be a hypnotherapist. Another is I'm already a psychotherapist and I want to learn hypnotherapy. Yeah. We also, and that's an adjunctive skill that I bring in. We will get people who come to us and say, we just like to learn the CBT aspect of it, um, which, you know, we'll do that from the beginners. Um, EMDR, no, you've got to be a a, a qualified therapist in order to right. learn that to begin with well, so that's because of encouraging the nature of it here. yeah well you, you you've got to understand it's you know it it will 
potentially bring up a trauma because if you're working on a particular node, even on with somebody you were going through working on a phobia or pain control, um, there are protocols for pain management within it. The nature of the mind is it will peel away the layers of the proverbial onion and suddenly bang, you're in the middle of something that, oh, I didn't know that was down there. Uh, whether it's real, whether it's not, is irrelevant. Irrelevant. It's something that's in the mind that's causing a problem, and so we have to process that through. And, and as such, when you do stuff like that, EMDR, or our, um, we also look at um, ego state therapy. Um, again, you need to understand the nature of trauma with those um, particular techniques because of the potential for connecting with trauma. Um, so what we tend to find then is people coming in, we, we lump, um, EMDR under the more clinical communication element, because you don't have to have hypnotherapy for that. Um, ego states, clinical communication, CBT, clinical communication, and, and so it goes. Um, so, but we're very much ensuring that people who, come in they know exactly we know exactly their competency because we need we're not we're never going to teach somebody you know somebody's um just come out of i don't know an engineering um degree and wants to learn emdr well no that's not going to happen you need to have a strong therapy background and an understanding of psychological disturbance before we can even go down there because emdr is a great therapy in its own right but it is a part of a process um so when for example when i'm working with trauma and if i'm thinking about using emdr i have several sessions of working with somebody outside of the emdr model to stabilize them to ensure that they are going to be cap um, capable of managing the experience of working through the trauma so resources coming up um, making impound changes within the present before we look at emdr and then that will take as many test sessions as it takes mm -hmm. and then we have to do work afterwards to consolidate outside of emdr the work that was done during that experience yeah so it's so, the school is the school has got a, a, a very um uh, deep uh, engagement in those things that that you you very much begin with as I put down here this medical mental health um, taking people put moving people into a to a uh, a seriously better state um, now the 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 way you you work through with the school and we're kind of focusing uh, on the school because that's really the the uh, the main Thing that we've seen so tell us anything else that's going on but there's that very strong uh the, the practical uh, clinical hypnotherapy and i love the way that you use the term uh, clinical hypnosis um yeah. it was something that ernie bashed into me he said uh, um we, we use it's it's hypnotherapy it's clinical hypnosis it's uh it's it's not just you know doing 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 hypnosis um so that aspect of uh, you've got the, the clinical hypnosis thing, then you've got these advanced courses, then you've got these integrative uh, courses that are going on. Mm. Now, are there, are there unifying mechanisms that, that you um, of, of the, that you're teaching uh, for people uh, in, the, in the way that they understand the work they're doing? Yes, I mean, we will always, we've always bring in the theoretical background to absolutely everything. Um, no point in just teaching technique. Technique is great, but if you don't understand what's going on underneath, you know, again, it's going back to, would you go and see a surgeon who only knew how to cut? Would you prefer to see the surgeon who knows how to cut, but also understands what's happening when you cut, what the um, pharmacology is, what the immuno uh, reaction is when you open up? You need to have that understanding. We also very much believe that there is not just one simple model of understanding how the mind works or how neurosis is created. If we just stuck purely with the psychoanalytical model, everyone would be going back into the past. Not everyone does. So what we, we're very much looking at is saying, here's the presenting symptom. 
here are the models that can be um, that can explain how this presenting symptom comes about here are the models of change and you know we look at the basics going back to basic behaviorism um, and behavioral hypnotherapy or or even with our cognitive behavioral approaches so you've got the behaviorism we look at um, the, the analytical approaches absolutely but they are tend to be more last resort because of the nature of where we're going we look at the cognitive behavioral approaches that um, come from within this we look at solution focused approaches because not every, every some people People, when you say right we might need to look into the past they don't you know, freeze and oh my gosh no way I want to go down there so they end up we will then end up looking at more of a, uh, a solution focused goal directed approach for them because who's to say that working in the present and looking to the future isn't as effective as working in the present and looking into the past you know it's courses for horses um or horses for courses kind of I don't know which way around that one, one of those is. you're on the other one side of the of world two. that's fine yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so um, you're giving so you're giving the the this thing with the students some how do they how do they uh, take to that this idea that they actually don't have <laughs> set uh, responses that they actually they themselves have choices and they have options and so on and so forth. what what we teach them is we're working with an individual we're not working with symptom and we're not working with one particular uh, model we're working with the person in front of you we recognize the client as a person not a symptom so we look at the client and understand the client and how the symptom is is affecting their life and then we talk through to understand how they feel the most appropriate route to resolution might well be um, so you've got the client's input oh, I really feel I need to go back into the past. Fine, we'll think analytical. I'm scared about going into the past. I don't think there's any real psychological issue here. Right, we'll start with behaviorism. And if it doesn't work, we teach people, right, this is how you move into um, selling the other model of, of working with, um, with somebody. And we set the client up. You know, um, We set the person we're working with up and saying you know, there are many different approaches that we can take um, and listening to what I would um, um, I think is the best approach working with you would be whatever it is we make that um, uh, that, 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 that that assessment and also we've got to understand as well you know therapists the world over we all have our preferred ways of working um and so um uh, we also have to recognize that this whole concept of of the pluralistic nature of, of therapy where the client is most important person but we can't um, ignore the way a therapist likes to work as well um yes and i, so I see it's, it's, Hmm. It's a dance almost. Um, you're playing, hmm. you, you've kind of got a dance of merging two people together and taking them in a particular direction that is going to um, uh, facilitate resolution, whether it's backwards, forwards, up, down, doesn't matter. Well, I think, um, Matt, a lot, of our, uh, uh, a lot of our psychotherapists and psychologists would, would be pleased to hear that because that, yeah. of course, is the, is the, the progressive trend at the moment uh, well I, I would almost suggest it's the, the regressive trend because that's kind of where we were uh, my my wife's doing a mental health course at the moment for mm. nursing and uh, and we we've just been looking actually at the dsm uh because ah, the dsmv yes. and sort of the, everyone's going oh, it's terrible but interestingly the dsm uh, five that we've just got the dsmv is going much more back into the non-specific, the more integrative type of aspects. Mm. And when we looked at it, that's actually where, you know, that biopsychosocial uh, type of model. Mm. And the DSM-1 was like that. It was actually really yes. two, three, and four that um, uh, went off into a little bit more of that medical uh, specific, um, you know, air, you know uh, uh, diagnosis and, and, and resolution. And that just leads me to the next quick one I wanted to get to because we get to NLP which is in there, which mm. is kind of a bit, it kind of throws throws the dice a bit both ways, you know. Um, uh, and I, I, I know some of my friends in NLP have just sort of said, well, we basically just figure out 
you know, what the problem is, and then here's the resolution for it. Uh, Stephen um, Andreas, Steve Andreas was, mm. I was lucky to be friends with him. And, uh, you know, he would sometimes say to me, explain to me the neuroscience, and I'd explain it to him, and he'd say, oh, I don't think I need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, so, oh, well, glad for the chat. Um, you pay for the beer. But um, this this aspect there, um, do you find NLP is like interestingly to the to the side? Is it still in the centre? Where does that fit into the framework of what you're doing? NLP is it's interesting. I mean, we are planning and developing a course on NLP, um, but within the uh, LSCCH model of teaching and integration um there is an awful lot of value within it, within nlp mm, yes. uh we we certainly use within hypnotherapy a lot of techniques that ostensibly one could argue came from um nlp at the same time nlp uses a lot of um stuff that came from hypnosis so mm courses for horses again um but no i would certainly bring things in like meta modeling um we'll bring in uh the anchoring approaches uh there there is you know the so-called fast phobia cure uh, or the rewind technique as we prefer to call it that originally as i understand came from nlp but it's used very heavily within hypnotherapy nowadays um as a management tool and it's Basically, you know, if it works, we use it. Mm. Um, but from our perspective, I want to understand, you know, what's going on. Um, so anchoring, well, for me, it's conditioned responding. goes back to the old term um, Pavlovian stuff. Mm. Um, so we understand the neural networks and the neural basis of what's going on. Um, there's a lot of – I think NLP is – it's, it's interesting because when you look at hypnotherapy nowadays, it's an amalgamation of, of lots of different things. When we go, you know, one thing that, that's that been really big, obviously, has been the third wave um, uh, therapies like mindfulness. Um, I remember hearing about mindfulness for the first time and thinking, oh, this sounds interesting. I've got to go and find out about it. And I went and found out about it. And I was sitting there thinking, but I've been doing this for years, but it didn't have a nice little label over it. Um, and then my Buddhist friends were saying, yes, well, they've just taken basics of Buddhist, Buddhism and sold it for the masses type sort of thing. Of, yes, we, we do have a habit of, of uh, um, yeah. cre- do, discovering what's natural and then uh, putting our own names mm. to it. Uh, so- and also giving nice new, nice new labels and nice um, new labels to it, yes, yes, yes. yes. This is this is very true. So we, uh, yeah, Matt, what are you, what are you thinking? Oh yeah, so I, I I'm just keen to jump in and to uh, appeal to um, Peter's scientific brain here, <laughs> and and going back to the beginning. So in your in you know your your training in um, um, in psychopharmacology, I'm just wondering, you know, how did how did that set you up? What did that afford you in terms of understanding? Um, mechanisms and processes in hypnosis? Well, for me, to begin with, um, the the very term, the drugs that we were researching, sedative hypnotics, Mm. made me think, ah, right, Mm. Um, that sounds interesting. Um, The fact that I was involved with psychopharmacology meant I had to gain an understanding of the mind, which is fascinating um the pharmacological side of it gave me an understanding of the neurology and the neuropharmacology of what was going on and so i got this really strong interest in the psychology and the neurology and then as i subsequently gone on the physiology and the immunology so i'm fascinated by the mind-body connection or psychoneuroimmunology so that was the first area that i got into then i i and having been the lucky recipient of having these drugs pumped into me um we used to do these uh we're doing research into um uh, dental phobia um and there is really um they were trying to 
get some money for the dental phobia unit and they wanted to have people undergoing dentistry um, whilst they were being sedated and the last thing they wanted was for these dignitaries to come around and find a phobic who's lying there with um, terrified or shouting you know i have been attacked by a phobic um, <laughs> In the tower that, um, that, that the dental unit in, in, um, in guys, dental unit's right on the something like 24th, 25th floor. Um, to get to it, you have to walk, you can catch the tube, but in one day the tubes were down. And yeah. so clients had to walk across London Bridge to get there. Um, we had a client who was an hour late, or a patient who was an hour late. She had a phobia of bridges. She had a phobia of lists and a phobia of heights. Oh, so Lord. by the time she got <laughs> to the 24th floor, she was you know, really... And so, and I had to tell her because she was late, we had to rearrange her, um, uh, her uh, yeah. appointment and she attacked me with her handbag, literally. <laughs> um, but what they didn't want was somebody who was out there being um, anxious. And so they kind of said, Peter, do you want to have, you know, would you be a subject? And um, we'll do something, we'll clean your teeth, but you'll be sedated. And I was like, yep. <laughs> and for free. Um, yeah. Um, well, I got to try nitrous oxide as well, which is marvelous. I'm, oh, I, I did that on the, there and, Yes, when my baby was born, it was really great. one for you, one for me, one for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. but I tried I tried sedation. Um and it was it was really interesting. And then later on, when I was doing learning hypnotherapy and I was having my first experiences of trance, I could then really think, ah, I see the link here between what is called a sedative hypnotic and um, what's going on um, within the brain naturally. Oh, that's fascinating. Right, you were right. feeling it in your <clears throat> own. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the, the, sometimes we do that. We're able to go back and go, oh, I'm sort of feeling my brain uh, doing yeah. Because you've got this this comparison. So actually, actually having the knowledge that you have, being able to imagine what's going on in your brain at a very detailed level, I would imagine mm. adds to the hypnotic effect. It, it does because I can talk to the brain. I can get my clients to imagine areas of the brain that I would like to stimulate or I'd like to calm down. I mm. don't sort of use terms like, you know, I'd like you to imagine your amygdala or your <laughs> somatocentric yeah. cortex, but I get, I, I um, get them to imagine those areas to focus inwards. Also, it's understanding that, um, I mean, for example, with, benzodiazepines there are um we always used to say that uh, the primary shareholder in roche products who basically developed these things um, was god because in the brain there are specific receptors for the benzodiazepines and there's always this search for the endogenous ligand the natural substance within the brain which um uh, these would bind to these receptors mm. as far as i know they've still not discovered it um mm. But that aside, um, I was thinking, right, well, if I'm going into this trance-like state, then whatever this natural substance is must be binding to these receptors um, and creating this relaxation response within me. And then a lot of the work I was doing back in the day, um, and this, uh, this question has yet to be answered and any researcher out there listening in, perhaps you'd like to uh, think about doing something with regards to this. There is the um, um, benzodiazepine antagonist flumazenil or as I used to know, RO151788, before they gave it a nice posh name. Right. Um, so if you ever go in for sedation, they bring you round by injecting flumazenil into mm -hmm. you. And so I've always been fascinated if someone who is a good hypnotic responder is injected with flumazenil, would it bring them out of the trance or not? And as yet, that question is Still yet to be answered for me. Yes, but it's these, that these type of mindset. Yeah, these are really interesting things. It just makes the whole process um, more. Um, uh, what can I say? Entrancing. The because uh, mm. it was it was something uh, for for me too. I came into the the Ericksonian world with a, a lot of knowledge in, in psychotherapy, and it was a very psychotherapy oriented place. 
Uh, but yeah. Ernie was the one who said, oh, wow, we're, we're doing stuff with genetics. And so suddenly um, those sorts of things we're looking at. And now we're seeing uh, the, the almost real-time um, gene expression uh, frameworks coming out of, of, of the, the sort of focused attention that we do in, in, in hypnotherapy. Uh, which is the same sort of focused attention that a lot of people do in 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 counseling and psychotherapy. And this is what is so delightful about this uh, school that you're um, that you're championing, uh, this London School of Clinical Communications and Hypnosis is this broad framework that that Matt and I are really pleased mm. about. And having sort of said how wonderful you are, uh, <laughs> but I, I'm very impressed. Um, but we're sort of, you know, sort of coming to a bit of our end of time uh, because this is another thing, attention spans. And we found that people have an attention span of about 30 or 40 minutes. And then, then they um, apparently their commute finishes and so they go home. But the, what, what's going, is there something coming up? Is there something particular? I mean, there you are in, in London. Where uh, we didn't really talk about that, that effects of COVID, but everyone's talking about that. I think we can all guess mm. it. You're doing a lot of work. Uh, you're managing to find uh, uh, some of these, so a little bit of something just about those online programs and online processes and uh, what uh, might be of a curiosity to some of our listeners. Well, it's, I mean, hypnotherapy, when you're training, is very uh, uh, practical skill. I mean, you've got to learn the um, you've got to learn the theory, but it's also a very practical skill. You need to do it unto others and have it done unto you. Um, it's a two way thing, and so obviously we used to have very much a um, a classroom based environment. Mm. You go in, there's lectures. You then have a demonstration. You then practice on each other in the classroom under the watchful eye of um, uh, the therapist or the lecturer and the assistant lecturers. And then dear COVID came along, and you know government was saying yes, you can continue. No, no, you can't. Yes, you can. No, you can't. So already we'd made the decision prior to COVID to, to go online, partly to have blended learning to fit in with the university system. So we would be doing live lectures online for the theoretical aspects of it. And then that would free up time in the classroom to do the practical aspects of it. And then COVID stopped all of that. So what we then found that we had to do was to transfer or transfer the, the practical aspects into the online um, teaching. And people were, oh gosh, you know, can it be done? Um, but what we'd also noticed was a trickle of people who were doing online therapy already. And so we worked away, and a, you know, a lot of people have, have, have done this shift, of being able to actually use a medium like Zoom that we're on and to be able to, A, lecture, and then use the facility of the breakout rooms to be able to, um, for our students to go in and to be able to practice in pairs in um, uh, in confidential confidentiality in a confidential um, area, but with our lecturers and our um, assistant lecturers and our facilitators being able to jump in and jump out of each individual room to keep an eye on people, just as we would in the classroom. Um, we've discovered that uh, being able to do a demonstration with the facilities now with, within Zoom of highlighting the subject and highlighting the, uh, the, the, the lecturer, um, we can do really good demonstrations. Mm. Um, and um, you know, so essentially, we've still got that teaching environment. But most importantly, uh, COVID has come along. We've been with COVID over a year now and it's likely to continue and there was a really huge worry that as a therapist people would not be able to to work well things are changing and um, things have changed you know I, I've got a, a, a thankfully a very large practice um, I am now 100% online 
Um, so all of my therapy is carried out online. And we've also recognised you can't just jump in and do it online because there are certain issues you've got to um, be aware of. There are ethical concerns and the form, the medium you're using. Are you using something that's HIPAA compliant? So it's um, totally confidential. And part of what we've now introduced within our teaching is... Yes, we're teaching you to do it face to face. We're also now teaching you how to do it competently, to know the pitfalls, to know what you can do online as well. So people are coming out and they're being essentially um, uh, trained to be able to work in both mediums. And I, you know, I really do think, yes, after COVID's gone and we're all vaccinated and whatever, there will be a certain number of people who will go back to wanting therapy face to face. I think that will be a small minority now. People are very comfortable. You know, we're teach, talking to each other from our homes. People are comfortable in, in having therapy in their own home environment. Why do I want to travel um, a half an hour or more, go and see a therapist and I've got to travel all the way back where I've, I can just arrange to have that session in my own home um as i say there are certain ethical issues we've got to be aware of and um things like that and ways of working certain techniques you know um uh, idiomotor response techniques where you've got the finger movements small micromuscular finger movements going on they're very difficult to do um even though you know you've got high high definition video and, and things like that uh, you know, I'm looking at you two and all I can see is sort of from the top of your shoulders or top of your arms up. I can't see your fingers. So if you're yeah, IMRing away, I, I can't see a thing. Yes, so yes. We're, we're learning how to adapt. Um, yeah. This is the new paradigm. I mean, I, it was interesting. I had a, I had a client the other day uh, who who uh, decided we were standing up actually she was quite comfortable doing that as a run home. but then yeah. she said i she said oh, I'm, i i feel like leaning I, I must lean forward i and uh and anyway she leant forward and she curled up and she disappeared out of the frame and <laughs> yes. uh you know i'm sort of trying to see her over there so it, but um but she was all right you know she kept saying something every now and again so i'm quite comfortable here thank you uh, so these sorts of uh, uh, teaching this paradigm is really terrific. I, I, I think this is. I, I'm really so pleased that uh, uh, we, uh, we we met you and and that you've come on our show. I, I'm going to come and well, talk you. to you next week, and I'll go you on your show you and we'll talk about <laughs> mirroring hands and, uh, and and some of the things yeah. in another frame. But but uh, Matt, that was that was something that was yeah. Uh, how did you go? Yeah, I, yeah. You were pretty pleased with some uh, of that. <laughs> yes, yes, I was. And I'd love to um, get Peter back at some time and um, get a little Anytime. bit more technical. Yeah, um, exactly. I, I've got all of these uh, questions rolling around in my head uh, on a more technical level. So uh, we might, now that we've introduced you to our listeners, uh, I might be able to come back and, uh, yeah, talk a bit more about some mechanisms that are going on there in the cranium. Definitely. More than happy to. <laughs> all right, but Peter. It's, yeah, it's been such a pleasure having you here. Are you, you'll stay safe over there in London town. So actually I'm in Essex, so I'm out oh, of London. You're, I've escaped London. Oh, you've so escaped I'm London. The southeast corner of England. Uh, oh, moment. okay. It's, where it's actually quite sunny outside, blue sky, and about three degrees, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> Essex, as they say. Oh, that's beautiful. Anyway, thanks okay. so much for coming and being our guest, and uh, uh, and I look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye.